Good evening, friends. This is Pastor Dan Lewis coming to you from the Grace Connection Church here in St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, we want to welcome you tonight. This is our regular weekly class that we do in, <clears throat> on uh, the weekend, uh, Saturday night, and then Sunday morning. It's played on YouTube and on our website and such, and it's uh, in correlation with Pastor Kelly and the church here, and we're just... Uh, Bless. we have a class, a live class, and then we have many who are online who can, <clears throat> and we appreciate your your attendance and hope you enjoy this. And drop us a note if you, if you care to, if there's a question or whatever. So let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening for your love for us. Thank you for your grace to us, Father. We, studying this book of Hosea, we see this incredible manifestation of your continuing undying love for us and we pray father that that would be the thing that lasts in our minds and remembering who Hosea was and what he accomplished in the plan of God and thank you father that uh, every day <clears throat> because we live in the church age we have the Holy Spirit within us to guide us and to we're able to stay away from sin and we're able to love you and to worship you because we have now the temple of God dwelling within us. Thank you, Lord, for that. Bless the Lord in these days. We pray for Israel. We pray for peace in Israel. As the psalmist said, in God, we realize what's going on in the Middle East. We pray that you just protect and guide, Father, and end that war for your glory. Pray for our, our government and our president and all that's involved, Father that they'll make good decisions for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, this evening, uh, or this morning, whenever you're watching this, we're going to, uh, let's read the text here. It's Hosea chapter 1. And we've done a number of uh, things to prepare us for what has happened here. And we're going to look at uh, the heart of God, this, this, this class, to see exactly what God thinks just about uh, his, his humanity as a whole, but specifically with Israel and then we as those who've been saved by uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and his work at Calvary. So it says here in verse 2, it says, And when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. And so he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Didlam, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel, for in just a, a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel and will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Now, <clears throat> just in background information here, We'll, dis we'll discuss a little bit of Jezreel in another class, but generally uh, the problem was that Jehu was uh, very rebellious and in in impatient in how he approached uh, disciplining uh, Ahab's house. And so that's why God, he, he overstepped his bounds and God was not pleased with that. So verse 5 says, And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel, now, Je now, Jehu was the king that had killed with the wrong motive in his heart. That was basically what it was, which displeased God and was made it ripe for judgment. Verse 6, it says, And he conceived again and bore a daughter. And, and the Lord said to him, Call her name, and, and from the Hebrew it's no mercy, no mercy, for I will... I will uh, more. Ha I will no more have mercy <clears throat> on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. Now, when we talk about the house of Israel, we're talking about northern kingdom of Israel. Remember, it was divided. The bottom, the to bottom kingdom was the kingdom of Judah, and the northern kingdom comprised of uh, ten different, uh, ten different uh, tribes that had settled the land of each Israel. <clears throat> they were that comprised what was called the, the the tribes of Israel, and so God's speaking to the northern kingdoms here, and he's 
He's saying, because you remember we told you how many of the, the uh, kings were all bad. There was hardly, there was nobody that really did anything right. And uh, so God, it come, this is the point of judgment. It says in verse 5, it says, or verse 6, it says, And she shall conceive and again and bring forth a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Go, to, go call her a name, no mercy. So, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Je Israel to forgive them at all. But I'll have mercy on the house of Judah, that's in the southern part of Israel, and I'll save them by the, the Lord their God. I will not, but I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. And remember the reason how God saved them was basically when he killed, Jehos killed Sennacherib in his temple and the 150, 180,000 troops in the middle, in the, when that, while they were sleeping at night, they were all killed. That's how it happened, happened where there was, there was no need for a sword or bow or whatever by war because God did it supernaturally based on the promise made to Hosea, uh, Hezekiah, excuse me, by Isaiah who had spoken to him. So, verse uh, 7, but I'll have mercy on the house of, of Judah, and that's what he's going to do. And then verse 8, and when she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And uh, the Lord said, give her name, not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. And then verse 10, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said of them, children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together at a distant time, this is a prophetic utterance, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Now, <clears throat> the point here is that God named these children as a reflection of his heart and what his heart was actually saying. And we find here that uh, God is saying, you know what? I no longer have mercy on Israel because Israel has turned their backs on me. They've done nothing possible to please me. I've loved them with an everlasting love. I've been patient. I brought them prophets. I brought them all kinds of opportunities to repent and they've turned their back on me. So I'm going to tell them no mercy anymore. And you're not my people. You've chosen not to be my people. Now God's saying that obviously to that particular generation, but that didn't remain of course, because God had made a covenant promise with with David, that's why Judah was spared, because Judah was a, of the descendant of David's household. So, there's a, we find here that there's no dramatic call out for Hosea from God like Isaiah or Jeremiah. Isaiah and Jeremiah had a direct call from, uh, direct revelation from God to, to be his prophets. But Hosea was simply God, simply one day, appeared to Hosea and spoke to him. And from that point on, God asks him to marry Gomer. And uh, Gomer's children are given names that represent God's attitude towards the northern tribes of Judah. The negative implications of these names later on will be changed by God in the future. In other words, it's not like God is saying, forever I'm going to hate you, forever I don't, you're not my people. But this particular generation has chosen to go against me, and so I'm going to give them what they want. Now, in, the, in a particular commentary, it says, although the people today may view the commandment that uh, Hosea was uh, to, uh, to uh, marry this Goma, uh, and we kind of touched on this last time, it's inappropriate uh, it, it, although people today may view this com command as somewhat inappropriate or detriment to the prophet's ministry, one should not try to rescue Hosea's reputation by interpreting this story as a parable or a dream. 
So a lot of people say, I don't believe Hosea could be actually something that God would endorse. But that's not what happened here. There's no doubt that God wants the marriage of Hosea, Hosea and the adulterous Gomer to represent God's covenant marriage with adulterous Israel. That's the whole purpose. Hosea does not express any opposition to this instruction. In fact, he accepts God's direction and follows it, even if it may seem a little strange. Now remember also, this is quite interesting when people say, well, God can't do anything that would be contrary to his nature. Of course, he's not going to, but there are certain things that he did. For example, the prophet Ezekiel, to illustrate God's message to the generation of exiles by living, he, God asked him to, uh, Ezekiel to, to lay on his side for 390 days and then to turn over and lay on his other side for 40 days. God also instructed Ezekiel to cut off all his hair with his sword. That's a little strange, but God had purposes in that as a reflection of his attitude towards Israel. And he even tells Isaiah to go naked for three years in Isaiah 20 verses 1 through 4. Now those are all seemingly unusual sign acts that effectively communicated God's truth to his audience that they were too stubborn to listen to any normal or traditional presentation of God's word. In other words, it came a point where they just, they just, they just said, you know, look, God wants you to run along. We're going to just do what we want to do. We're going to worship who we want to worship, and so forth. Now that brings me to my consideration tonight, which I want you to think with me about. Have you ever experienced being betrayed? Have you ever experienced it? Specifically, the area of betrayal of adultery which is one of the most painful things one can experience. Do you remember what it felt like? Did it really produce deep heartache in you? Maybe experiencing the hatred for you replaced the intimacy of your love. You just no, no longer could you have a relationship because there was this unbelievable, maybe potential hatred. You could not figure out what went wrong. Uh, you, did, you did your best to be the loving husband, the loving wife, or even to be a loving friend. You could not understand why that they would not love you, love someone, that, that they would go and love someone else in a relationship. What a terrible thing. I, mean, I was married 50 years and neither one of us committed Adultery, at least in, in openly, uh, maybe in our minds, but those are things that, who knows, I guess the world with all that's in it is certainly the potential for that. But to think that someone you loved decided to leave you for someone else, uh, maybe you experienced bitterness and resentment. Maybe you wanted revenge, a chance to get even. Because of your simple um, commitment that you made, you're really deeply shocked by the un, unfaithfulness. You see, marriage is a covenant, and that's what God is getting here to, where each party makes a commitment to be loyal and to be faithful and to love one another. Till death, death do us part. That's a commitment that God you know, they, we, we say that when people get married, it till death do us part, because why? It's a commitment, it's a covenant that lasts forever. Maybe we can just imagine from our experience what God experienced and what it felt like from just seeing what we, what we just, those questions raised in your heart. Israel was the smallest of people in the nations of the earth. When Abraham came, when God came and made a commitment to Abraham in Genesis 12, he, taught that he, he, he told him that the Hebrew nation, Abraham's uh, generation, would be specially loved, specially blessed, and specially cared for solely 
by, as by God. Their number would be as the sands of the sea, and another passage as the stars of the heavens. And uh, they would experience a love, protection, and care from God that no other nation would because they were in a covenant relationship with God and with his people. Now, some people have said, well, what do you mean? Israel's a small nation. How come it says the sands of the sea and the stars of heaven? It means that that's referring to you and I who trusted Jesus Christ and multitudes of Christians who follow the same God as the Israelites did, except the Messiah that they were looking for and rejected is the one that we accept as the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why they would, they would experience this, and we are the ones responsible for it. So he, God, loved them with an everlasting love. That's why we're going to be in heaven someday. I mean, if we will measure our sin and measure our failure, and maybe we've even been in the place of betrayal of others, someone else. Maybe we've, we've, we've just done things to hurt people and stuff. And yet when we've come to God and repented, God's forgiven us. God had sent them prophets to warn them that they could not go on as is that's why they killed the prophets. Jesus looked over Jerusalem in Matthew 23, 37. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her, her brood under her wings, but you weren't willing to do it. In other words, God... God says, time and time again, I've loved you. Time and time again, I've done my best to be the one that loves you and you've turned your back on me. So last week, remember, we recalled the promise made to Israel, to Joshua, when they had regained the possession of the land. Remember what they said? And these are the ones that now their descendants are beginning to, uh, to uh, come here. And we find that... Uh, that uh, in Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 through 12, it says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. But put the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the, the Lord. And then, then it says, verse 16, And then the people answered, Be it far from us that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us out and our fathers out of the, the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery and who, who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we want, went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Ammonites, Amorites and the, that lived in the land. And therefore we will serve the Lord for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, you're not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. Joshua's challenging him here, and he says, he's jealous. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he'll turn and do to you harm and consume you after having done you good. And they said again in verse 21, but no, we will serve the Lord. Well, that lasted about one generation. The reason why I would bring that up is that's exactly what's happened in, in country after country in the world where Christ has been honored first and then where, where the church has prospered. All across Europe today, you cannot find hardly any country that has a solid testimony for Christ. There's churches and there's things, but it's far from what it was in most of the population has given over to idolatrous things of the present age. But you see, the, Israel's history is the same as with us. And this is what brings us hope tonight. Uh, what really brings us hope. The history reveals the cycle of discipline. There was rest in the land. And that's what God, this has happened in the book of Judges. We described it a couple times ago. But during Joshua's lifetime and for some years after, the people enjoyed 
the blessings of the land and they loved God and they honored God. Then there came a time of rebellion. There was rest and now rebellion. The new generation rose up and they forgot God and they rebelled against him and they followed in the Canaanites' idolatry. I'm going to tell you just as we close out this class some of the Canaanite idolatry so you see what happened. Then thirdly, there was retribution. So rest, rebellion, then retribution. As Just as God had said he would, he would do from the protection and the power and delivered them into the hands of foreign oppressors. That's what happened. In other words, God came in and he judged them. And that's what happened when they were taken to Babylon and they were scattered all over the known world. And then number four, in repentance. So we have rest, rebellion, retribution, repentance. Israel repented of their sins and cried out to God. In Judges 10, 10, it says, And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and, and uh, have served the Baals. And then the gracious God, the fourth R, and put rest, rebellion, retribution, repentance, then there's restoration. God raised up a judge to deliver them from their oppressors and lead them back into fellowship with him. And God always, when people repent and change from their ways, God, God in his matchless grace and mercy, and his unbelievable kindness, just pours out his love and says, okay, I forgive you. That's the thing tonight that you and I have as a guarantee and assurance in our lives. God forbid that we live in sin, that we forsake it, that we let the Holy Spirit guide us, that we say no and we turn our backs on sin. But if we fail, we have a place, we have a throne to come, the throne of grace, as Hebrews 4 says. And Jesus, when we cry out to him, he forgives us. All God wanted to do for Israel and for us is to extend his grace to us. That's all. He To be the merciful God he is. Thus we find that Hosea was called to fulfill the role of identification with God, of how God felt about his ter this terrible idolatry <clears throat> and forsaking him as their God. And we're going to see as we go through the, quickly through the rest of the, the book, because the first part really kind of reveals certain things. We're going to see how God was so merciful to him. But the conditions were it became so bad at times that Israel, the children of Israel, offered their idol, their babies to the idol Moloch. M-O-L-E-C-H, Moloch. Moloch was a very, very strange brass idol, terrible idol. Charles Solomon, in one of his, his descriptions of the idol, says this is the idol called Moloch. A great many people used to pay, pray to this idol. It had the head of a calf, and it was made of brass, and it was hollow inside. There was a place in the side of it to make a fire in it. And when it got very hot, the, the wicked people used to put their little children in its arms, and the little children would burn to death there. This man, we'll show you here, I have a picture of it, and for our class to see, I don't know if you can see it there or not, but it's a, it's a picture of this hideous looking uh, idol that was, uh, that was made and, and the little babies were placed on its arms and, and that they would be burned up because of the incredible, terrible heat that was there. And uh, so they would, the thing they did because it was so, so even to them themselves, this, the, the, we find that they put the, there were people, the people all around were blowing trumpets and beating on drums to make a great sound so that no one could hear the poor little children cry as they burned to death. So Hosea, in conclusion here, Merrill Unger in his, his great uh, dictionary, he said this, Hosea is the prophecy of God's unchanging love for Israel. Despite the contamination with the Canaanite paganism and fertility cults, the prophet bent every effort to warn the people to repent 
in the face of God's perpetual love for them. This theme is uh, four, fourfold. Israel's idolatry, its wickedness, its captivity, and its res restoration, similar to the six steps. Throughout the entire book, however, he weaves the theme of the love of God for Israel. Israel is depicted prophetically as, as Yahweh's adulterous wife, shortly to be put away, but eventually to be purified and restored. These events are set forth in the divine command that the prophet marry a harlot. The offspring of this union are given the names that we've talked about before, and uh, thus this is God's step to having everyone in Israel understand just how much his, his love has been offended, but that there is a promise that he's going to be gracious to them. Now next class, we will see how God's anger does not last forever. He changes his decision to completely destroy them if they'll only repent. Unfortunately, the northern tribes didn't, and eventually Judah was taken into captivity as Nebuchadnezzar kept, came and took the city of Jerusalem and scattered them and took a vast number of, uh, of uh, the Israelites to, to Babylon. So in thinking about this tonight, in conclusion, as we think about this, God, you know, God, all of us sometimes have to think carefully about our actions. God loves us. He's given us grace and mercy and everything. But how does God feel about this? When we decide that we're going to sin and we're going to practice sin, what if we, what if, how does God feel about it when we act that way towards him? Well, you can tell that he, he, it breaks his heart. That's why Jesus, when he stood over the Jerusalem and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he says, I, I would have loved you and I would have taken you in like a, a hen with her chicks under her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And that's we, we want to be in a place tonight where God, we seek God and we live short accounts of our sin, that we repent, that we live kindly, that we love God and we live with a humble and broken spirit so that we bring praise to him. So may God richly bless the Father, we thank you for our class tonight. We ask, though, if there's anyone that's tuned in or whatever that hasn't found Jesus as their Savior, that they would, they would find him and that they would trust him and, re and repent of their sins and let him cleanse them and, and redeem them. And, Father, give them a new life in Jesus Christ. Thank you, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good night now.